Hello and welcome back to the Clean Sailors podcast, all about sea, marine, sailing and keeping it clean. I'm your host, Holly, founder of Clean Sailors and a sailor myself with a passion for the health of our mighty oceans. In our podcast, we explore some of the ways in which sailing and our wider marine industry can become that bit cleaner through conversations with experts, innovators, scientists and activists, all working towards the health of our seas we showcase the people and projects changing the way things are done. In this episode, we'll talk about anti-foul. Now, for those of you listening who own boats or work on boats, you'll understand full well the time and energy and cost that goes into priming, protecting and scrubbing our bottoms. Since at least the ancient Egyptians, recorded accounts have referred to the variety of marine creatures that make their home on the bottom of our boats. These creatures can be particularly pesky for a number of reasons. They create drag and slow down the pace of our vessels through the water. They increase our fuel consumption, which is not great for emissions. And for wooden boats, well, they can burrow into the planking and break down the strength of those fine materials that already separate us from the seas we sail. And since ancient Egyptians, at least, sailors and seafarers have been trying various substances and techniques to prevent weeds and barnacles from making home on our hulls. From hot wax and tar to copper sheathing and lead cladding by the ancient Greeks, the quest for an effective biocide has taken various forms. Anti-fouling is a necessity at sea, but anti-foul paint is releasing millions of tons of microplastics and other chemicals into our waters. And as we know, microplastics and nasties in our waters more often than not end up in our food and then in us. The very nature of anti-foul techniques is to deter living species from settling on our boats. So it's kind of obvious that anti-foul paint would be toxic, but given that anti-foul paint comes off our boats over time, when in the water, it continues to prove pretty nasty for a variety of marine species, including coral, for a long time afterwards. We've actually found out that around 50 million litres of anti-foul paint is making its way into our seas each year. That's a lot. So what can we do about it? Well, I spoke with Dr. Rick Brewer, material scientist, doctor in biofouling, winner of the European Inventor Award 2019 and founder of Finsulate, an anti-fouling technique conquering the environmental hazards posed by traditional anti-fouling paints. Rick, thank you so much for joining me. It's great to see you. Great to be here. I am really looking forward to discussing this topic with you again, because appreciating that anti-foul is somewhat controversial topic, and maybe not a new one, but certainly the developments and innovations in this space, your product included, have been remarkable in the last years. But maybe let's start with your background. So why biofouling? If you look back at uh, why I choose this topic, it's a bit of a strange story. I used to like the biology when I was in school, but I thought, well, is that typically something I want to make my job out of? So I wasn't sure, so I decided to start studying material science. And by the end of my studies, I came across this position, this kind of graduate position in a research institute. And in this institute, they were doing corrosion research, which was my main topic back then. And besides that, they were doing anti-fouling research, research into environmental-friendly anti-fouling technology. And somehow, the, that point, I was triggered by the biofouling topic. Looking back, it's probably because I always liked the biology, I always liked nature. So that's probably the main reason why I was attracted to it. And uh, that's 20, 25 years ago. And I started loving it, loving it because of the combination of material science and biology. And I think that's the main reason why I wanted to get involved into the biofouling and the environmental friendly anti-fouling technologies. Just to confirm, biofouling begins when we've got these tiny waterborne organisms and they go from being free-floating in the water body to attaching themselves onto a surface, right? And they become somewhat stationary in their lifestyle and they cling on and they hold tight and they just keep, I guess, growing and proliferating. And then other species and organisms kind of, kind of join them for this 
for this kind of biofouling party. So obviously anti-fouling is then making sure that that doesn't happen on some surfaces, underwater surfaces, such as our hulls, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Anything that grows can also grow onto the surfaces. Just to give you an idea, why would an organism, why would an animal grow on a, on a surface? Normally, an organism would have to walk around freely to get the food. But if you look in the oceans, if you sit, sit tight and you're in a flow, in a current, a lot of the, uh, is it, of the food, a lot of the nutrients, they just float by. So for some organisms like barnacles, like mussels, for them it's easier just to sit tight and wait for the current to bring along the food. That's a really, that's a really good point and a really good visualization. Part of me is thinking, I wish that could happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> food passing by and you just kind of have minimal amount of effort to get it. But, but it's an important visualization, right? Because obviously we're talking about, say, the bottom of piers and anything stationary in the, in the water, but obviously stationary boats, but also moving boats. I mean, this is biofouling happens pretty much consistently in an underwater environment, as long as the speed is kind of slow enough that organisms can attach. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it starts I think, within half an hour after deploying a boat or putting some structure into the water. It starts right away with bacteria, with the microfouling. And depending on where you are in the world, in tropic environments, of course, the growth is much faster. Here in Europe, growth in wintertime is not so fast. It's almost, as I said, it's almost neglectable. Mm-hmm. And in summertime, it can go really fast because then the organisms, they know, well, I have some months to grow. There's enough light, there's enough food. So if you go to the Arctic zones, even there, you have a lot of biofouling because, yeah, also there, there's life. It's only in a different, yeah, in a different place. That's a really good point, because I was actually about to say, surely water temperature plays into it, and I guess it does in some respects, right? But naturally, there's going to be organisms that proliferate really well just in nutrient-rich waters, such as the Arctic and Antarctic. Yeah, you even see the difference. So water temperature is really important. Sunlight, of course, is, is important for some creatures like algae, but also the source of nutrients. So sometimes you have a place around the world where there's yeah, not such warm water, but there's a lot of nutrients. So if you look at the Pacific, for example, there's a lot of nutrients coming from really down the ocean seabed. So the water doesn't need to be high still to have a lot of growth. And also there's places where I guess you get upwelling, you know, where you get sort of shells and otherwise and nutrients are pushed towards the surface. It just creates this really fertile environment, doesn't it, for things to grow? Yeah, exactly. So it's coming up from the oceans, but also the deltas and the estuaries where the, the rivers come into the oceans. Also typically a place where yeah, the water is shit nutritious <laughs> and there's a lot of growth. And you're an inventor, right? I appreciate you've got an exceptional scientific background and I know that you obviously are very, nature is very important to you. And you also enjoy spending time in the water. So what in some ways was it about your experiences here that gave you some inspiration around biofoul, right? And that sort of your innovative anti-foul solution. Yeah, so if you look at nature, of course, there are organisms that use chemicals, that use toxins to prevent growth. But there's also a lot of places in nature where without any chemicals, without any toxins, the creatures, they still stay free of fouling. And that's quite peculiar. And then uh, when you're doing research, you start investigating, you start thinking of, well, which creatures have a lot of growth, which creatures don't have growth. You start investigating the reason why. And that's actually when you come across one principle in nature that I've started utilizing, and that's the principle of of spines, of hairs, so the fibrous structures. Because there, if you look at a sea urchin, which is a nice example, you don't see any growth in it. But also, if you look at the pelage of of a mammal, for example, it also gives a protection. It also makes sure that there's no fouling can attach. If you look on land, look at the thorns of a rose or those kind of things. If you have, yeah, uh, organisms uh, try to protect themselves. They have, sometimes they have these needles. So it's a common, it's a common principle in nature and that we have developed in such a way that you can also, yeah, make it an, an artificial spiky surface. And it was sea urchins in particular that you found quite interesting, right? What was it about those? I mean, they appreciate that they're the spikiest and whilst beautiful, you do stay clear, <laughs> no matter what size you are. What is it about that in particular as a species that maybe triggered something or gave you some some route to your final product? Yeah, I think it's a combination. If you if you go out for a dive, you see lots of lots of beautiful creatures, of course, but you also see that uh, lots of surfaces get clogged with founding you know, with barnacles, mussels. They tend to stick anywhere. And then if you look at the sea urchin, there's no growth from them at all. And so it's yeah, it's almost like seeing is believing. <laughs> so you see these sea urchins and I have never seen any 
urchin with any growth on them. It's almost so frustratingly simple when you put it like that, because obviously anything that's super spiky is an incredible deterrent to anything coming near or living on it, right? No, and that's it. And of course, if you look more closely, there's more things involved. But the concept, the principle, it's quite simple. And then and the, tr- the trick is to get it uh, to get it into practice, yeah, to make a real product out of it. Which is a huge step, right? And I think it's interesting because I was we've talked for a while, but I appreciate that even sharks too. And you mentioned like some mammals, but I was reading about sharks, and sharks obviously quite have quite a unique skin structure, made of like tiny scales, which help reduce the drag and ultimately also help prevent the sharks from being biofouled and I guess like you know an equivalent to shark skin maybe wouldn't work so well on boats because they're stationary for prolonged periods of time and perhaps because they are can be relatively slow moving because you do see like barnacles growing on species such as whales for example but not sharks I guess that does come down to a combination of skin structure and speed in that sense right there's some things that are actually more innovative and useful yeah, it's a combination. So it's indeed, they are always swimming. The seals they lie around more frequently. But it also has to do with, yeah, like you say, with structure, huh? like this, this shark skin effect, which is, in my opinion, has to do a lot also to do with the hydrodynamics. Huh? So it's, I think if you would have a shark skin laying still, you would get growth on it. But still, the concept of, of structure, of texture, it's an interesting one. Def, in the end, if you look at our product, for example, we started off with these very spiky st- structures. And at the moment, we are developing also much more smooth structures, huh? really more like uh, like the, the pelage, like the skin of a mammal. Uh. So it is finding an optimum. And you, you'll never beat nature. That's, I'm sure of that. Not in the sense that there's always something that's going to settle on the surface. But also the fact that what we find in nature, these structures and how they manage to stay free of fouling, we're never going to beat those organisms. I'm sure of that. But I think it's, you make a really interesting point, right? And I think that nature can be such an inspiration for innovation and doing things differently. And I think it's almost an inspiration that often we overlook, although it's all around us. I mean, you take like things like camouflage and apparently the aerodynamics of bullet trains came from the kingfisher birds and you know velcro is a you know substance of two parts that stick together so well came from the structures of seeds you know much like to your point about spines but sort of hooks so there's there's so much that's been inspired by birds and, and insects and sort of flora and fauna I kind of I think in some ways it's almost again frustratingly simple because once you see it it's almost like why why <laughs> Did that have to be such a big innovation? It kind of feels so obvious once you've actually seen it. But I appreciate that's the that's the role of the inventor, <laughs> such as yourself. Yeah, but it's also it's, yeah. If you look at it in a plain in a plain or flat way, it's not even the invention. It's coming up with the idea, and then the long road. It's actually not the invention itself, but it's the yeah, getting to a commercial product without having too much negative effects. Mm-hmm. So you have to, in our case, you have to find a way to put these spines, put these fibers on the surface without them detaching. So that's a that's an interesting one. Yeah, you have to find optimum between hydrodynamics and the filing performance. Those kind of those kind of questions. There's the questions when you get the idea, you don't think of those questions. But that's the things that come along when you start developing the industrial product. Which has been a huge journey, hasn't it, in some ways for you and appreciating that, you know, Finsulate is now an anti file product which is, you know, increasing in its sort of geography as in you can buy it and and sort of get it applied to your holes in various countries in Europe already and we'll talk about that soon but in terms of the actual product because I appreciate that if people haven't seen it it's very difficult to imagine an antifoul that isn't painted onto your boat bottom so what does it look like what is the process of applying finsulate to a hull uh, it looks, and let's put it as simple as possible, it looks like velvet, or it looks like the one, the version we have for, for fast boats, it looks like velvet. And the ones that you use for the for the bigger vessels, it looks like a carpet. Yeah, so it's, if you look at it, you would indeed, like you say, you would not consider it an anti-filing material. And so it's, it is kind of strange, and that's also why it has taken quite some time to get you know, to get into the market, to get to a point where people don't ask anymore is this possible yeah, because we've done the uh, five six hundred yards by now we have done several bulk carriers so we've shown that it's possible we've shown that it works and that makes life life easier but if you look back at the concept it's a strange concept putting these fibers 
And then instead of putting it as a paint, we decided to make a wrap. And so just like you want to change the color of your car, you put a wrap, a self-adhesive wrap over it. Instead of painting in it, we decided to put the fibers as a wrap. And so that's also something completely uncommon and illogical to most boat owners. It's huge, right? And I guess to your point, again, about sort of coming up with the idea and then making it an actual reality, I think part of that process is an incredibly creative process, but I appreciate a very difficult one is such a leap of the imagination. It's not almost changing just the content of anti-foul paint, as many people have tried to do and done, but it's changing the way of the way we think about anti-foul and actually what purpose it serves, how it's applied, how long it lasts for, and the very way in which it interacts with the environment in which it's used. Yeah, yeah to be open about it, when we started with this whole fiber structure, we started in the, in the fish farming business. One reason is, of course, that if you're farming fish, you don't want to have toxic anti-fouling close to the fish. But the other one is also because in the beginning, we were not sure what it would do with the resistance of the drag of a boat. So we wanted to try that first before putting a product in the market, which uh, intuitively should increase the drag of a vessel. And so it's also even for us as a company, it has been a road to accept that a product like this can work on a boat. And like you said, it's not just working on a boat. You've done bulk carriers all the way down to you know much smaller boats and small kind of sailing vessels, right? So it really has been applicable on most vessels there are yeah yeah the biggest one so far it's 140 meter long and what is it for the english the ones it's 500 foot i think roughly for we, we also talk in meters <laughs> <laughs> so thank you nah, just to get just to get an idea it's a it's huge boat it's three thousand square meters of surface yeah. Yeah. and that's not the biggest ones if you look at container vessels they're over 300 meter long so that's double the size or double the length of what we've done so far and it's maybe even 10 times the surface because it's not only getting longer, it's also getting broader and deeper. So that's, mm-hmm. But that's, that's interesting. But if you look at the overall surface, then also you, you look at, yeah, at the smaller boats. If you, look at, if you make a calculation of the total amount of surface for the pleasure craft, for the yachting, you come to the same amount as you have in the bulk carriers or in the, the commercial marine. It's applicable for all kinds of vessels, but it's also important not to use the biocidal anti-fouling for any vessel even if it's a small boat. And there's like, I think it's, it's about 18 million yachts around the world. And yeah, it sums up to a rough estimate of 500 million square meters. And if you compare that to the amount of commercial marine vessels, I think there's less than 100,000. And then if you calculate that, or you know, multiple that by the surface, the average surface, you'll come to the same, to the same surface. So Overall, people sometimes, it's not so common anymore, but in the past people said, yeah, but it's just a sailboat. It's just a few square meters. Yeah, but then I think that's, that's like a past station. So even if you're a small polluter, you're still a polluter. I think that's a very good point. And I think there is often a perception within sailing and within, I imagine, a lot of industries, but I'm just one boat. I'm just one person. It doesn't matter if, if I do this, but I think you're right. I know you mentioned about 18 million. I think actually the leisure, certainly boat sailing and motorboat kind of market you're probably in excess about 30 million leisure boats on the planet and to your point if each one of those has to have anti-foul because we all do right it's the only way you can get by then obviously the gross impact of that is actually pretty gross <laughs> it's pretty nasty and I think that's it, obviously this is you know the primary focus in some ways of, of our conversation today is actually what exactly is the issue with traditional anti-foul no, actually, it's it's a combination. Eh? So in the past, the main focus has been on the biocides. So a lot of nasty biocides have already been prohibited. The chemicals um, and the all the stuff. Yeah, that's, uh, the, 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 that's the start. But recently, it's, it's it's also becoming more and more clear that also microplastics, it's a big issue. And if you look at the total use of biocidal paints, of self-polishing paints in the world, it's 100 million liters uh, roughly per year. And this is 50% it's volatile organic compounds, so it's, it's solvents that evaporate while you apply it. The other 50%, it's a combination of biocides and paint. And the paints, the anti-fouling paints are designed in a way that they slowly dissolve in the water. So the paint, which is in the end, it's for a big part, it's plastic. It gets into the water. And we're all scared of throwing a (laughs) a bottle, a water bottle in the environment, which you should not do, of course, but that's only one of the sources of the pollution. I think this is a, probably, and this is, something that you and I have talked about before, but I think it's such a fascinating and very important point for us to pause on for a minute, is that 
I think we've obviously understood, certainly in recent years, and perhaps more so in the last like two years, where it's become such a focus of public attention, that most of ocean microplastics come from the land. And actually studies recently, beginning of this year, for sure, have shown that so much of that actually comes from the sailing and shipping industry and the hulls of boats, right? I mean, these studies that have come out and I know you were aware of this study way back earlier this year, and which has now become recognised by the European Commission as showing that there is a, a colossal amount of microplastics which can be directly attributed to the hulls of ships and boats. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's massive. And yeah, it's a study, it's not the only study, but this, the most recent study was done by the University of Oldenburg in Germany. And they did an investigation, so they did an analysis of the microplastics in the in the water in the German bites so on the north of Germany in the, in the seas. And they found that about 80% of the plastics they found was actually paint waste. And yeah, that's dramatic. And that's the most dramatic I've seen. There's other studies that say, well, the microplastics is the third largest polluter. So it's the or a microplastic source. And so they say, well, the single-use plastic waste is the first and the car tire wear. It's the second, but it's at least the third place. It is the biggest source of microplastics. Which is phenomenal, isn't it? Because I'm not sure as an industry and even as an individual sailor with a boat, one had imagined that actually we could be having such a devastating impact on our waters so directly. And appreciating too that it's also quite a difficult thing for sailors in particular to hear because... I hear this a lot and it's it's very true in some respects, but sailing has got to be one of the most sustainable forms of travel and we're using the power of the wind, which is all true, but appreciating that we are sitting in and living in the water. And as to your point, 90 plus percent surely of boats are still anti-foul painted on their hulls, right? Which is the yeah, majority. I think, even more. I think it's 95 or higher uh, the percentage probably. And it's, uh, don't get me wrong, I understand that people use anti-fouling because, yeah, if you don't have an anti-fouling or you don't prevent the, let's put it like this, if you don't prevent the fouling, you don't move with your boat anymore. And so you have to anti-foul in some way. But there's, mm-hmm. there's different ways to do that. <laughs> Biocidal is not my preferred one. I'm always open about other alternatives. So of course, mm-hmm. I have my own product, which I believe it's quite a good one. But I don't care if people use ultrasonics or use silicons or whatever, as long as you don't do the biocides. That's for me, that's the main goal of getting out there. Yeah, the the biocides and the paint, right? Because the I think biocides and the paint, yeah. Great. I think just to pause again on that point around the German bite study, I mean, this is literally and it's something that you very recently shared too, but quoting verbatim from the European Commission, recognizing that particular study. They've said that it inverts the assumption that the most marine plastics come from land-based sources. And instead, in parts of the German bite in particular, marine sources, shipping, far outweigh those based on land, which is the packaging, consumer packaging, which is huge. I mean, I guess, like we said, in some ways, it's a leap of the imagination to recognize a product which isn't traditionally painted on and then scrubbed off and as I mentioned at the beginning, it's quite a laborious process to look after a boat and haul it out of the water every other season and scrub the bottom. And obviously in that process, whether it's being sandblasted or otherwise, you do see them being washed down and a lot of that material running into the water. So even when sailing or on using sort of boats and ships on the water, the paint is being broken down into that ecosystem. But obviously we're also actively removing it on land. And unfortunately, the way that a lot of our marina and boatyard environments are set up aren't also geared to capture that so in some ways a product like Finsulate solves for both of those issues right because there isn't the whole pulling out the water every couple of years and and sandblasting it and doing whatever else on the bottom to get the old paint off it literally is like almost like a stick on leave it for five six years and pull it off we hope then in the end and it's yeah for us it would be ideal if you have a product which can last 30 years 25 30 years now, what we've done this year, for example, as we've started doing more and more new builds, so new yards that are delivered, and then you see that uh, that's a really good moment because you don't have to remove the old anti fouling pens. It's ideal to get started right away with Finsulate. And more recently, we even got some references now for eight years, seven and a half, eight years usage. And the, still those Finsulated boats, they still are in pretty good shape. Some damages maybe, but in general in pretty good shape. So for the moment, we yeah, we say, well, we can guarantee five years, but the estimated lifetime is 10 years at least. 
can you imagine 30, even 30 years, like 10 years, even five years is pretty much unheard of with anti-foul paint, right? Because obviously your bottom gets bumped and it naturally degrades in the water and even stuff does grow on it regardless of anti-foul paint, right? And you often see these round the world races and sailors who almost midway through their racing have to hop over the side, tie onto the boat and start defouling <laughs> on the way, right? Just because, because it's very impossible to stop things that want to, you know, stick to oh, you. And that's it. And that's, that's also what we say within Finsulate. We say, we always say, well, it's not perfect product. So also with Finsulate, you still need some cleaning. Of course, if you're continuously sailing, probably not. But as soon as you start mooring somewhere or have some fun time in a harbor, you will get some fouling. It's not the perfect product, maybe, but it's as good as it gets, I think, because there's always going to be a creature that will be able to settle on the surface. But when you say it needs some cleaning, to the normal everyday sailor, say, such as myself, cleaning your hull would mean taking it out of the water. you probably got various bits and pieces growing on there. It could be quite an arduous process to, like, chip it all off because these things are born to stick, right? Barnacles <laughs> and otherwise. Describe that even the process of cleaning, because I also think this is quite impressive around Finsulate. It's not as arduous, right, to get biofowl that has stuck onto your boat off. No, that's the general idea as well. If you know that you cannot prevent everything, then make sure that if something grows on it, it's easily cleaned. And that's what we actually what we do with these hairs, with these fibers. There's always going to be a scattered barnacle on the surface, but they can only sit on the top of the fibers. And if they sit on the top of the fibers, they cannot create the base plate, the footprint that they need to settle and grow. So even if they settle, they're still not really attached. And that's actually the case for, for most of the organisms. So you can have growth, sometimes some soft growth, like ascidians or whatever, but you easily wipe it off. As in with my hand? I still wouldn't recommend it because it's, if you go over a barnacle, or must, there's always a chance of getting your hand hurt, of course. But in principle, yes, you can do it with your bare hands. And I think that's a very fascinating point and it goes back to your, you know, the, the pure invention and the genius in some ways of this product, right? And I say, I don't say that lightly, is the surface area. And it's something that you've articulated well to me in the past, but again, worth dwelling on is that actually by covering your hull in Finsulate, which is itself a structure of fine fibres, any organism can only attach to the very tip of either of those fibres, right? Imagine almost like, your woolly jumper and only on the ends of those little bits sticking up can a barnacle or microorganism attach itself so you've effectively reduced the surface area of the hull in the first place to a much smaller percentage than what is it normally exposed to the waters through you know anti-foul paint and otherwise yeah, if you look closely, if you look under a microscope, you can see that uh, there's maybe only 5%, 5 or 10% of the surface is covered by the fibers. It looks like a really dense structure. But if you look more closely, it's yeah, the surface area covered is only 5 to 10%. So like you said, uh, you can't get these organisms creating their footprint because there isn't enough footprint for them to stick on. Exactly. exactly. So there's a, just, just 5% of the surface to sit on, even if they would attach to one fiber or maybe two or, or a few. Still, the attachment is never as strong as when they attach to a flat surface. And what do you, appreciating that the environmental merits of a product such as Finsulate are incredibly high and incredibly difficult to argue with, given not just the studies, but also our understanding of what goes into the makeup of, of sort of anti-foul paints. But what would you say to a sailor, a boat owner, a marine or a boatyard who still wasn't sure about switching to cleaner anti-foul products and practices, what would be like your one-liner to them to get them to really consider things differently? Ooh, a one-liner. You if you want, you can have two. <laughs> yeah, I think you, you're enjoying nature as a sailor, especially as a sailor, you're enjoying nature. So just as for me, I'm not really an actual sailor myself, but for me, it doesn't really fit to be enjoying nature and to be polluting it at the same time. Mm. And that's, that's a mindset. And I know that a lot of sailors, somewhere in the back of their mind, they know it, eh? that, they, that it's not right what they're doing. And for a long time, of course, there's been the argument, yeah, but there's no, there's no alternative. But by now, there have been some good developments and there are alternatives to toxic paint. And then really the question is, well, you want to enjoy nature, why do you pollute it? Mm-hmm. That's a very, very, very fair point. And I think also we're naturally placed because we see, you know, the beauty of nature so frequently and I know you perhaps don't necessarily sail but I appreciate you love diving that actually once you see that once you can appreciate it even from an intellectual and aesthetic level that 
it's very difficult not then to want to protect it. And to your point, the solutions are getting... Maybe to give you one more, one more example of it. If you look at the corals, everyone is very concerned about the corals bleaching and dying. That's something with doing an environmental friendly and defiling, you will not change it eh? because it has to do with global warming, with acidification. But no one seems to realize that the copper from the anti-fouling planes, it decimates the regrowth of corals. And there's been some studies in Australia that have shown it. So the, the speed at which larvae are reproduced, the, the corals reproduce through the larvae, it's only a tenth of the speed what you would have without all the copper around. Yeah, you go diving <laughs> to the Great Barrier Reef, but at the same time you're spoiling it with depleting copper from the anti-fouling plane. Mm, that's a really, really huge point. As well, and I think it also just again intellectually anything that's not native to that environment or any environment really is bound to have a positive or negative feedback loop. Normally, it's it's a positive feedback loop which results in something slightly catastrophic, such as the as the coral analogy that you're referring to. But I mean, in terms of again to the to sailors, boat owners, mariners, and boatyards. How much more expensive is Fintulate, for example, than traditional anti-fouling products? And I think it's worth, obviously, us underlining here the time as well as cost, because you know how much time it takes to take a boat out of the water in a season to get your little slot in the boatyard, to get them, get it booked in to have the hull done. Or in many cases, and in fact, probably most cases, people doing it themselves, which obviously is very time intensive and perhaps less cost intensive, but certainly more intensive in terms of environmental impact too than getting it done professionally. So how much better is Finsulate from a time cost perspective for any of us using it? Actually, uh, maybe it's a little bit difficult to put it in exact numbers, but what we see is that, of course, it's, it, it's not a product you buy based on cost. So it's if you compare it to having an anti-fouling plane applied by a shipyard, we are comparable. So in that sense, people that don't do the work by themselves, but have it done by a shipyard, then the cost is comparable on a single installation. The only difference is, of course, that you have to remove the old anti-fouling plane. So that makes it a bit more cost intensive. But in general, we are really competing for price. We're not competing on price, but the price is competitive compared to a good anti-fouling plane. Mm-hmm. So if you're used to have it applied, there shouldn't be any any reason why not to change to a product like Finsulate. If you look at the do-it-yourself people, there's a different story, of course. Like you say yourself, yeah, you do the labor as a boat owner, so you save a lot of cost there. But what we notice here when selling the product, talking to customers or potential customers, what we see is that the people that are interested in a product, interested in having an environmental-friendly product, they don't care too much about the price, but at least they have to make sure that they can, I don't know if it's an English term, but if they can count backwards, so they, they can make the calculation for themselves. So mm-hmm. yes, it's more expensive than buying a jar of paint. But if you calculate doing this every other year, if you have the lifting cost of your boat, maybe cleaning costs in between, extra cleaning costs. So there's a lot of costs involved. People normally would say, well, it's not relevant, just buy the jar of paint. Mm-hmm. But if you add everything up, then on a five-year scale, normally also a do-it-yourself person can earn back the investment in Finsulay. Makes total sense. And I think also the, as you mentioned, the environmental, but also in some ways moral impact, right? And obviously it's something that we clean sailors believe in very strongly is that, you know, if you use something, then we've got a responsibility to protect and preserve it as far as possible. So I think over time, seeing Finsulate grow and seeing more people become more aware of the fact there are other solutions out there. And as you mentioned, Finsulate is is an an example, but a great example. And there is ultrasound is another one, which is pretty non-invasive and certainly biocide-free and paint-free also. But there are solutions out there. And also, you've obviously had a very exciting year so far, a few years, but certainly in the last year. And I appreciate that you're expanding. So where at the moment can sailors, seafarers and boat owners access Finsulate and get their bottoms done? In principle, anywhere around the world. So focus is on Europe. So we have a dealer network actually in the Netherlands, of course, Germany, France, Mediterranean, most countries. We just started in the UK a few months back. So we're present in the UK as well now. But we have coverage in the US, in Canada. Even we sent the first six rolls of material to Australia a few weeks ago. So in principle, we are recovering the world. Of course, it's like we have a massive turnover yet. But we are available around the world. That's very cool. And Rick, what do you see as your next kind of goal or the future, not just of perhaps 
anti-fouling, but perhaps you also as a, a water appreciator and an inventor and a scientist and obviously a business owner. What do you see the next couple of years being for yourself? Oh, yeah, I think it will take a few years <laughs> to get really successful. That's how we've made a good start. But we made a good start in the yachting market. I think that's been quite an important one because we have tried it in the commercial marine already before. But what we've seen in the past is that in the commercial marine business, there was not so much of an environmental incentive. And that's why we, we switched more to the yachting business. And in the yachting, it's picked up now. And what we see now, and we get more and more requests again from yeah, other countries. In Europe, we have several initiatives in Greece, for example, several boat owners in the Netherlands. We've done the first Navy vessel in the Netherlands, a small one, but still the first one. So I think the next big step is getting accepted in, in the commercial marine market. In the yachting market, I'm pretty sure we are accepted now as an alternative to the toxic plants. The next step is getting accepted in the commercial marine and hopefully grow further towards markets like the offshore wind, for example. And so you have to have also protection against corrosion and biofouling. But then you have to guarantee like a 20 to 30 years lifetime. So that's the next step. But it's exciting. Yeah, I can see it coming. Yeah? The product itself, there's no reason why it should why it should be great. So I'm not afraid of 30 years lifetime. Of course, we have to start proving it, but there's no reason why it should not work. It's an incredibly exciting journey, and I appreciate that it has been a very exciting one to date. And it's been a pleasure to speak with you again. It's great to see you, and thank you so much for joining for this conversation. You're welcome. You've been listening to the Clean Sailors podcast. All relevant links to the projects and people we talk to can be found with the podcast link. For all episodes or to get in touch, just visit cleansailors.com. We love to hear from you. We believe that great ideas should be shared, which is why our podcast is free to appear on. So if you've got a project, idea or topic you think we should be discussing, get in touch. In the meantime, thank you for listening and see you for the next episode.